Praise the Lord. God bless each and every one of you. It is that time again. It seems like I haven't been in here in quite some time, but it is great to be here. Praise God. To um, And we welcome each and every one of you to another broadcast uh, on today. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus. God is, is a good God and he is worthy to be praised. He has been blessing us praise God hallelujah he has been moving by his spirit hallelujah we thank God for all the things that we are learning in Christ uh, we praise God hallelujah Jesus for the the wisdom and the knowledge that the Lord is giving unto us even through the man of God even through the word being preached the word being Taught, hallelujah, we are being built up and edified in our most holy faith and we thank God, hallelujah, Jesus, we magnify the Lord on today for that, hallelujah, and I just want to say, hallelujah, if you are a person um, that um, is not, uh, does not read a lot, I encourage you, praise God, to um, get into a place, into the habit of reading not only scripture, but get into the habit of having um, Christian books that you can be uh, read and be edified and uplifted on. One thing that I've always done since I came to know Christ as my personal Savior, hallelujah, I used to stay in the bookstore called uh, Christian Publications in Manhattan, New York. And as a matter of fact, that's where I met my husband. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because I always loved to read. And I didn't just pick a book that I wanted to read if I liked the title. But a lot of times the Holy Spirit would lead me to a book to read. And um, I want to share one story with you. Uh, I remember I went, I went to Christian Publication and I bought this book. I believe the title was um, the, of the book was um, The Power in Praising God. I believe that was the, uh, the title of the book. And I usually do it on the, a Saturday. So that Monday, I believe it was that Monday morning, I was on my way to work. And I was reading, I usually read my Bible first on the subway or vice versa. And uh, I was reading this particular day, I was reading my, the scriptures, but I had the book that I had just purchased on, on my lap also, but it was underneath the Bible. And because I was planning on reading that book after I read a few scriptures. And when I was reading my Bible, there was a Caucasian man standing up over me and he was holding on to the subway strap over me and I was sitting down. And um, I happened to glance up at him and he was looking up in the ceiling and he had his eyes closed and I knew, and right away I knew he was praying. And um, I looked at him, I was like, I said to myself, okay, I, I believe um, that I said something like, okay, this man is praying, or oh, I thought it. And just as I was b about to look down back to my Bible, he looked down at me and he said, a uh, sister, uh, I, there is power in praising God. And I, um, the Lord said, told me to tell you to read the last five books of the book of Psalms. And if you know the book of Psalms, the last five books, uh, um, chapters of the book of Psalms, they're not books, they're chapters. The last first, the last five chapters of the book of Psalms is all on praising God. All, all five of them are on praising God. And he said, there's power in praising God. Read the last five books of the division of Psalms. 
And when he and then he got off the train because the train stopped and that was his stop to get off and he got off. And I was like, okay, thank you, praise the Lord, you know, God bless you, or whatever, whatever I said. But what I was so shocked and amazed because that was the title of the book that I had just bought that weekend. And I was just about to read the book. But he didn't see the title of the book because my Bible was on top of the book. So I knew right there, not only was that man speaking by the Holy Spirit, but me buying that book was also by the Holy Spirit. And it was just so amazing how God confirmed the buying of that book with the words that that man spoke to me because he spoke the title of the book and told me to read the Psalm, the book of Psalms, the last five uh, chapters of the book of Psalms. So I'm encouraging you, uh, men and women of God, children of God, uh, get, a, get into a, the habit of reading Christian uh, books that will build you up in your most holy faith to encourage you, to strengthen you. When me and my husband got married, he had a library of books and I had a library of books. And when we came together, we had so many books, Christian books, and that we had, you know, we didn't have <laughs> a, a place to put them all. But uh, when we got our house, we had books in the basement. He had books in his office. I had, you know, and so we had books all over the house. <laughs> so just to, just to encourage you to um, pray um, before you buy the book. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to the book that he would have you to read that will build you up in your relationship and with, in, in your walk with the Lord. Amen. That is my word of encouragement for today. Praise God. Let us bow our head in the words of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you. We magnify your holy name. Thank you again for this day that you have allowed us to see. Praise God. We thank you for the man of God that you have been using each and every time we open up this broadcast to teach us and to preach the word of God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you would continue to fill him so that uh, to overflowing so that he will have to fill us. Hallelujah, to, to pour out into us, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for each and every family member and each and every uh, child and man and woman of God who feels it not robbery to get on this broadcast and to listen to the man of God and his teachings. We pray, Father God, that you would build up the broadcast, oh God, that have other people to come on and to listen and to be lifted up and edified and built up as well. Lord God, we put this broadcast in your hands and we pray that you through your Holy Spirit will speak to us, oh God, through the man of God on today. Have your way, bless, bless each and every household represented here and we give you your name, praise, glory and honor in Jesus' name. We pray and we believe. Amen. Praise God. God bless each and every one of you. And at this time, we turn the remaining portion of this broadcast into the hands of our Bishop Hampton. Hear ye him. God bless you. The day's message from Bishop Hampton is entitled, It's Time for Action. Join us now as we listen to the message. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Always glad to see you here with me. Always glad to be here with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day that I will say of the Lord, He is my rock, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Well, it's another Sunday, another opportunity for our lesson. We bless God for such an opportunity. I won't have a lot of ado this morning. Let's just have a word of prayer and get right into the message. 
<clears throat> Father God, we thank you this morning. I thank you for another opportunity to be before your people and declare to your people what thus saith the Lord. Father God, this is your word. These are your people. I am your servant. It is all about you. It is not about me, us, or we. It is about you and you alone. Father God, I pray this morning that you would help me to preach the truth of your word, to preach Christ, him crucified, to preach your law as it is written in your book, to preach the concept of grace, uh, to preach, Lord God, faithfulness to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now, Lord, I pray that you would quicken this vessel of clay. I pray that you would take every part of me, everything that is said on today, and use it for your glory. I pray that you would open minds, quicken ears, and understanding that we may know the truth of the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you this morning for hearing my prayer, and I thank you for answering. In Jesus' name I pray, and I believe. Amen. Well, you know, uh, believers like all other people are prone to procrastination, but there is a group of people among us that are yet lost, are yet living in darkness. They are yet under the impression, persuasion, uh, belief it may be, that they have plenty of time and some even believe that time isn't even a factor that they can live any way they want to for as long as they want to and there won't be any consequences nothing could be further from the truth but all that really does is reveal to us how great a responsibility we have to take the gospel to the lost, to be light in a dark world, to be a city on a hill, to be a lampstand, to be a candle set on a bushel so that we might bring light to all who are around us. There are far too many so-called believers who are sitting on the proverbial fence of indecisiveness, allowing their life to be directed by practices, protocols, and norms that hinder the life of God intended for them to have. To break this stronghold, we as believers must be swift to bring them the redemptive message of the gospel and say to them with great urgency, now, not then, not in a minute, not up the road, now is the appointed time. Now is the time for action. Hallelujah. You might say, what action am I referring to? I am referring to the action that begins with acknowledging God. The Bible tells us that all who come to God must first believe that He is God and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Therefore, we must make known to many that there is indeed a reward for those who do diligently seek God. But none of this can be done until we first acknowledge that He is indeed God and that we need Him, not the other way around. He desires us. He wants to be in relationship with us. He loves us as his own, which we truly are. 
but we must acknowledge that he is God. People, wake up, get off this whirlwind of unbelief and social conformity, political rhetoric and vain philosophy. Acknowledge God as God and come to the truth of liberty that is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, true emancipation from the bondage and brutality of sin. Hallelujah. He is God. He does reward those who diligently seek Him. And the Bible even goes on to say that we must seek Him while He might be found. This statement means that there is a window of opportunity for this to happen. That window will at some point close. At which point, all that will be left is God's judgment. Let's look at the word action. Since I have said to you that it is now time for action, let's look at the word action as an acronym, beginning with the A. A is to acknowledge God as God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, very familiar to many of us, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Don't allow yourself to fake yourself out into believing that the life of sin that we have all lived at some point does not bear with it consequences. First and foremost, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And it's not just physical death. Oh, it's death to your dreams, death to your relationships, your ambitions. Everything about us dies when we are entangled in sin. So the A is acknowledge God as God. Here's another piece of scripture that may encourage you to do so. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. It reads as follows. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. There is no place in time that we are going to come to where God's word no longer matters. It will always but always be significant and we will always but always be held accountable for what we have done with it, especially once we have heard and known. Just as I said on last week, we then become accountable. I will say throughout, once you know, there's no excuse. The appropriate response to knowing is to take heed, to begin to develop a life of obedience. Hallelujah. 
this is the proper response once we have acknowledged God as God. Okay. B. I mean, I'm sorry. C. I got my alphabets wrong. C. Confess your sins. Stop living in pretense. Stop pretending like you're good the way you are. You are not. And the burden upon your soul and your heart of guilt concerning your sinful living, no matter how much you try to pretend is not there, indeed it is. And only God's forgiveness can lift that burden of guilt and shame. I remember all too well of trying to pretend that I was okay with the way my life was going. Certainly I was not. And none of us who have been under the clutches, under the bondage, under the dominion of sin are comfortable in the way in which we live. So why not confess your sins? First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, he being God. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. What a wonderful deed. What a gracious and merciful God. And if he stopped right there, it would be enough just to forgive us of having lived outside his will, his way, his commandment, to bring such grief and demise to his heart. If he could forgive us all of that, then that alone would be enough. But he goes even beyond forgiveness. The B clause of this verse says, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The stain that was placed upon us from this sin. Not only is God willing to forgive us, but to cleanse us from it. Don't you know that once God cleanses you of your sin, it is no longer there to be seen? God cast it off into the sea of forgiveness and you have been washed clean. Brand new start. Oh, what a glorious blessing to have been forgiven of our sin and to be cleansed from any stain that it may have left on us as a person, on our personality, on our effort, on our attitudes, on our hearts, on our ability to love and care for others, on and on and on. We are just cleansed in every way. You got any more evidence, bitch? I sure do. Glad you asked. How about James chapter 5, verse 16? It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Why? That ye may be healed. I don't need to explain to you the correlation or relevance in Scripture between sin and sickness. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. To be relieved of our sin, to be forgiven of our sin, to be moved from under its dominion, to be cleansed from its stain is absolutely a healing for us. And this healing is predicated upon our confession. You know, as a parent, and I'm sure I'm talking to some parents right now, how many times have we said to our children or have our parents said to us, just tell me the truth, implying forgiveness, 
implying a willingness to move past the offense, but requiring the truth, not so much that we need to hear it, but they need to confess it so that they might be relieved of the guilt and shame that accompanies the bad behavior. And know for certain, when I talk about sin, I am not just talking about bad behavior, but everything that is involved in it. Everything that contributed to the bad behavior, the faulty reasoning, the false belief, the, the justifications, the, li the lying, all of that that brought about the behavior. Confession is necessary to free yourself from it, from the burden of it. Hallelujah. So we make this confession one to another. We pray one for another. We receive our healing as a result. Listen now. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It took me quite a bit of time studying this verse before I could make the connection between the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availing much to include healing and restoration, it took me a while to realize that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man could not be put into play if he was harboring sin. And therefore, confession is necessary for your prayers to become fervent and effectual and to bring about the healing and deliverance that God intends. It is all predicated on confession. Hallelujah. T, right? We've done A, we've done C. Let's do the T. The T stands for turn. Turn from your wickedness. Here we are in Ezekiel, 33rd chapter in the 19th verse. We find there these words. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. He shall live by what is lawful. He shall live by what is right if he turns from his wickedness. Make no mistake, the scriptures clearly saying to us that there is no possibility to live lawfully or to live right if we continue in our wickedness. Can you hear me? There must be a turning away from. The Bible calls that repentance, does it not? Repentance is the culmination, the agreement of having come our sin and turned away from it. These two together constitute repentance. Repentance is not just, I'm sorry, I wish that hadn't happened or I wish I hadn't have done that. No, it is a very deliberate, intentional turning away from with no return to it. Not saying that you may not have some challenges. If you're early in your faith, you're a very young believer, you may struggle for a minute or two. 
but never should you willfully return back to that lifestyle. Do not be as the dogs who return to their vomit. Hallelujah. Bless the name of our Lord. Romans chapter 6 verse 6 says this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. If it's crucified, then what is it? It's dead. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Christ. Because we believe that if we have been buried with Christ in his death, that we shall also be resurrected with him in the newness of life. And the newness of life does not bring with it our old ways, our old attitudes, our old behavior. It doesn't bring with it it's our old sin. For how shall we who have died to sin continue in it? Hallelujah. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Do you have in your understanding that until you repent of your sin, confess your sin, turn away from your sin, that you are a servant of sin, that sin is a master over you, a ruler over you. But when we confess our sin, when we turn from our wickedness, repent of our sin, turn away from it, the Bible says then we are no longer under the dominion of sin. We are no longer a servant to sin, but now we are a servant of righteousness. We are a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know in scripture you have read where the disciples on many occasions have addressed the Lord Jesus Christ as master. Implying and indicating that they were his servants. As am I, as are you who believe. You heard me say as recently as the prayer right before the start of this message. These are your people. This is your word. I am your servant no longer a servant of sin. Hallelujah. So we see that the T is that we must turn from our wickedness. Well, let's move on to the I. What is the I, Bishop? The I is to inquire. Inquire of the Lord his will for your life. If we've acknowledged God, that he is God, if we've confessed our sin, if we have turned from our wickedness, then we must now inquire of the Lord what is his will for our life. Psalms 32 and 8 points us in the right direction. Psalm 32 and 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. This verse is saying to us, is God, is God is there, ready and willing to teach us in the way in which we should go. He is there ready and willing to reveal to us his plan, his purpose, his power so that we may walk upright to the glory and honor of our Lord. Hallelujah. 
he goes on to say, I will guide thee with my eye. You know, we are all guided by our eyes. We see when we should stop. We see when we should go. We see when we should turn to the left or to the right. But here in this verse, God is saying that we can trust him to lead us. Lead us where, Bishop? Lead us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. What a beautiful thing when we are wanting and willing to live in the way that God would have us to go for his name's sake. What a wonderful thing that we choose to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. And you cannot help but have a better life in doing so. Hallelujah. So we should inquire of God how we are to live, study the scriptures, pray, seek God's face. Zephaniah, second chapter, third verse says this, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. Thou, those are they who are not too proud. Those are they who have agreed not to lean to their own understanding. The meek are those who have acknowledged, confessed, turned from their wickedness, and are now actively pursuing God's will for their life. All ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Boy, he gives us quite an incentive there, doesn't he? He says, you meek of the earth, those of you who have been wrought in his judgment, those of you who understand the wrath of God, seek to be meek and you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Woo, what a beautiful thing. How we always talk about he that abideth under the shadow of the Almighty. God hides us in the cleft of his holiness, in the cleft of his righteousness, under the wings of the Almighty. Hallelujah. So we must inquire of the Lord for his will concerning us that we might walk in the path of righteousness and have the life that God intends for us. This is not a life without trouble. This is not a life without challenge. But it is a life where God promises to be with us every step of the way. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will be with us whithersoever we go. He will be a comforter, a teacher, hallelujah, a healer, a way maker, a provider. He will be all that we need in every instance that we need it. Hallelujah. We will, must learn to be as non-resistant as water. Hallelujah. You know, water flowing, and if it encounters an object, it simply goes around it, cuts another path. When hardship and adversity comes to us, we must be as subtle as the water and allow the Lord to redirect us. Or sometimes we may need to just be still. Sometimes an accumulation of water, hallelujah, will overcome 
the obstacle. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Praise God. Then there is the O. What is the O, Bishop? The O is to observe. Observe to do all that is written in the scriptures. Joshua 1 and 8, one of my favorite verses. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy, out of thy mouth. What does that mean? That means that every day, all day, in every instance, we should be saying what God is saying in response to wherever we are. The book of the law shall not depart from our mouth. We should be forever confessing God's law, God's love, God's peace, God's joy, God's healing, God's comfort, God's power. This book of the law should never depart from our mouth. We should observe to do all that is written in it. But we should meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, then shalt we make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Do not miss the relationship between saying and doing. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Faith without works is dead. Therefore, we must proclaim, we must speak faith, we must speak those things that move us toward victory, and we must do those things in conjunction, in agreement. We must act in accordance with our speech. We must say that which gives life, and we must do accordance. Proverbs 28, verse 4, says, They that forsake the law praise the wicked. Let me read that again. Proverbs 28 and 4. They that forsake the law give no attention to God's commandments, have no intentions of following God's rules, God's ways, God's law, are in essence praising the wicked. You're not praising God. By denying God's word, by denying God's authority in your life, you are in essence praising the wicked. I didn't write it. I'm the messenger. But such as keep the law, contend with them, them being the wicked. Have you not found that to be true in your life? That as you walk in, uphold, and defend God's law in your life, have you not found that it puts you in contention with the wicked? Those who do not praise the wicked, those who keep his law, contend with the wicked. Okay, lastly, but certainly, we must never, ever let go of our faith. We must never quit. You hear me say it all the time. We must never quit, faint, give up, or allow despair to overwhelm us. So then, herein is the end. What is the end, Bishop? The end is never. Never give up. Never give in. I have a few scriptures for this one. Because once you have acknowledged God as God, once you have confessed your sin, been forgiven of God, turned from your wickedness, 
inquired of God his will concerning your life. Observed, made a decision, became confident in living out God's will for your life. Now, you must stay the course. Now, you must persevere. Now, you must do all that is required of you, trusting God to care for you. You now have come to the point where you say, God, I am committed to a life of godliness, a life of righteous living. I am committed to love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. I am committed to love my neighbor as I love myself. I am committed to look not just on the things of my own, but also on the things of others. I am committed to esteem others more highly than myself. I am committed to look on the needs of others, not just the needs of myself. I am committed to walk upright. I am committed to holiness, to honesty, to integrity. I am committed, committed to be a representative of Christ, my Lord and Savior. I apologize if you uh, hear the ringing. It is my failure to have uh, silenced my phone. Uh, so I do ask your forgiveness of that. Um, but we're going to press on nonetheless. James, first chapter 12 verse, says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now, mind you, we are in the end now. We are in the never give up part. So, in fact, before I do, James, let's do Galatians 6, chapter 9, verse. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Why? For in due season you shall reap. If you don't faint, if you don't give up, if you don't get tired, if you don't grow weary, then you shall reap your reward. I say it at the end of every message. I'm sure you are familiar with it by now. Never give up, never give in. And now there's a story told among believers about Peter's crucifixion, that he was crucified upside down. And the reason given is that when they informed Peter that he would be crucified, he said, then crucify me upside down, for I am not worthy to die in the manner of which my Lord. Possibly folklore, possibly oral tradition, in any event, I think the moral of the story is to always leave a place exclusively for Jesus. The Bible does say that Jesus did not think it was robbery to be equal with God. Nor do I, for the Bible says we have been created in his very own image and that God desires that we be conformed to the express image of Jesus Christ. It even says that we do not see yet what we shall be, but when he appears in us, we shall be just like him. Having said 
all of those things. Those are the things that keep us pressing toward the mark so that we never, ever give up. James 1.12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, temptation, trial, test, or difficulty. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. What is the relationship between us loving God and us being tried? Is, is, it is our love for God that affords us the endurance that we need to persist in our trials, to continue on in our difficulties. It is the love of Christ that constraineth us, that controls us, that governs us in every situation. First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rather do this, rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. His glory being revealed in you because you have persevered, because you have endured, because all of that trial and affliction and hardship has perfected you and brought you to the image of Christ, to the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does not the Bible say that the Lord learned obedience? We too are learning obedience. How are we learning, Bishop? Through the things that we suffer. What are the things that we suffer? We suffer the diligence of resistance against those things which are unholy, unlawful, unrighteous. Whatever the cost of for us to remain steadfast, as we do so, we learn obedience. The enemy. Hallelujah. So we should not only should we not think it's strange, but we should rejoice. We should rejoice when it comes about, because these things are going to reveal Christ in us. Hallelujah. Philippians 4.13. Notice there are more verses for the never give up. I have done this intentionally as I was led to, because we in the end, we must persevere. Once we have done that A-C-T-I-O, now we must last. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. We must run all the way to the end. We must finish the course, we must fight the good fight. We must keep the faith. We must hold fast to that which is good. We must lay aside every weight that does so easily beset us and we must run with patience looking always unto Jesus keeping our eyes on the prize of the high calling of God which is in our Lord hallelujah Romans 5 3 
Whoops, let me get this one. Philippians 4, 3, as I was saying, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So, strengthens me tells us what the context of the verse is. When we feel overwhelmed, when we feel that we can't go on, when we feel we're not big enough, strong enough, we don't know enough, whatever it is, Christ will empower us to continue on in our journey. And we will discover that we can do all things. In fact, let me do you a favor here and take the word do and substitute it with the word endure to further your understanding. I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation worketh patience. Trials, difficulties, adversity, teach us how to be patient. Hallelujah. Teach us how to wait on the Lord and be of good cheer. They teach us how to be still and know that He is God. Hallelujah. Bless the name of our Lord. Deuteronomy. 318, 31, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 31 and 8 says, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. Wait a minute, he's out front? Yeah, Bishop, he's out front. That means that he got there before me. Hallelujah. And what did he do when he got there before me? He prepared that place for me. Oh, I'm spiritualizing now. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. So what should I do? Fear not, neither be dismayed. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but to me, that is exceedingly good news. And the Lord goes before me. He'll be with me. He will not fail me. He will not forsake me. Therefore, I do not need to be afraid or dismayed. Fear is in my heart, dismay is in my mind. Fear shakes me, makes me reluctant, apprehensive, nervous, anxious. Being dismayed makes me confused. Oh my gosh, what should I do? What can I, what can I do now? God says that if I can embrace the truth, hallelujah, if I can stand fast, and be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then I will not need to be afraid nor dismayed. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but for me, that is exceedingly good news. Second Corinthians, my last verse. Second Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, says, For which cause... We faint not. He's talking about the cause of the gospel. He's talking about the cause of the glory of God. He's talking about the cause of righteous living. He's talking about the cause of holiness. He's talking about the cause of redemption, sanctification. Hallelujah. He says, for this cause, we do not faint. We do not grow weary. We do not get tired. We do not get scared. We do not stop. We press on for this cause. And though our outward man perish, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Every day of our resistance to sin, Every day of our resistance to the enemy, every day that we live in that way, our inner man gets stronger and stronger and stronger. 
every day that we choose to live with God, for God, in godliness, our inner man grows stronger day by day. Hallelujah. And you know why? Because this light affliction. You, you hear the scripture saying, this is lightweight, man. These, these weapons that the enemy form against us, it's lightweight. And you know why it's lightweight? Because it will not prosper. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. So we don't need to panic every time we realize that one is being formed against us. God didn't tell us that he wouldn't form them, but he did tell us they won't prosper. Stay in the press. Keep moving forward. And when you can't move forward, just be still and know that he is God. Don't waver. Don't go left. Don't go right. And for certain, don't go back. Stay in the press. Because God has gone before you. The battle is not yours, it's the Lord. He is our keeper, our caretaker, our comforter. He is our all in all. In Him we live and move and have our being. We are what we are by the grace of God. Hallelujah. So why do we stay in the press? We stay in the press because this light affliction, which is but for a moment, we know that, right? Trouble don't last always. Weeping might endure for a night, but joy coming in the morning. Hallelujah. And our perseverance, our endurance in our times of affliction and hardship is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Oh, hallelujah. God is, we are being glorified as we persevere. God's glory is being manifested in our lives as we endure. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare turn around. Don't you worry one bit about the world rejecting you. It rejected our Lord and Savior, and so it's going to reject you too. What fellowship have light with darkness, wickedness with righteousness? Don't you worry. Don't you worry one iota. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, make your requests known unto God. Hallelujah. God, I'm in a spot and I need. God, I'm in a situation and I need. And you shall discover that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. While we look, not at the things which are seen, we can't see his glory right now. Hallelujah. We can't see the fullness of our salvation right now. We can't see the fullness of our redemption right now. Right now, we see vaguely as through a glass, but then, Mm -mm. after we have endured, after we have persevered, then shall we receive the crown. Then shall we see clearly. Then shall we behold him, my God, face to face. Oh, what a glorious day. Oh, what a glorious day. Paul says it'll be worth every trial, every difficulty, every hardship. Hallelujah. This light momentary affliction is just working for us 
of manifested glory. Hallelujah. For the things which are seen, the temporal, they're going to pass away. But the things which are not seen, God's glory, God's plan, God's power, they're going to last forever and ever. I have two things for you now. One, God loves you. Two, I love you too. Nothing you can do about it. So I'm going to say to you, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Know this, that your labor is not in vain. Because if you don't grow weary, if you don't faint, if you don't get tired, if you don't quit, if you don't give up, you shall receive your reward. Until we meet again, God bless you. This concludes Bishop's message. Tune in next week for a fresh message from Bishop Hampton.